Well, good evening and welcome to another Wednesday night Bible study at First Baptist Church. Thank you for joining uh, again tonight. And I, I've already seen online that we have people uh, that, are, that are watching. And, and I appreciate you taking time out of your week to study the Bible together uh, as we look again at the book of John. And let me say that uh, I know that we had some uh, difficulties last uh, Wednesday night with the uh, video feed. Um, won't have those problems tonight. That, that issue will, has been taken care of. But uh, I'm sorry it didn't work out well last week, uh, but uh, it's been taken care of now. And so <clears throat> because it, uh, you didn't get to hear what I had prepared last week, I'm going to share that, that Bible study with you again. So if you've been following along, in the book of John, you know that we had gotten to chapter number eight, <clears throat> and so you won't miss out uh, as, we, as we move forward. So in just a minute, we'll be reading John chapter eight. <clears throat> but let me also say that, uh, just to give you a little update as to where we are as a church, I uh, announced this last week, you probably already heard it, but uh, we are continuing with phase two of our regathering for worship plan here at First Baptist Church with uh, worship at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning and then also worship at 10.30 a.m., and then Sunday school opportunities for adults at those times as well. Um, also, we uh, have our deacon election planned for August the 16th, and that is our would be our regular um, planned date for that deacon election, and so we're going to go ahead with that, with that as planned. Um, we know that a number of our church members are not able to attend uh, worship in person right now because of uh, health risks and things like that. So this week we're mailing out uh, the deacon ballot to uh, a great number of our attendees. And so these will go out tomorrow or on Friday. And so many of you will receive in the mail a deacon ballot for you to pray over and then, uh, and then make your selection and then send back to the church uh, in a self-addressed stamped envelope that will be supplied uh, in the mail out. And so if you want one and you don't receive one, uh, if you'll call the church office next, uh, next week, early in the week, we'll make sure that you get one. Uh, otherwise, if you're able to be here present on the 16th, then you'll be able to uh, participate in the deacon election as well, uh, then in person. <clears throat> so also this, in this mail out, you'll be getting some information about the financial health of our church and some other plans that we have moving forward. Uh, we've not been able to have a business meeting since, um, since March, so we're going to be planning to have a business meeting also on Sunday, August 16, but that'll be at 6 p.m. Uh, in the Family Life Center. And, but we'll say more about that a little bit later. I hope that you take the time to look online at our prayer ministry uh, document and uh, pray over the names and other items of interest that are listed there as well. Uh, for instance, when we pray this week, we certainly want to be praying for those in our church family and around our church family who are dealing with illnesses and uh, other uh, troubles in life that come to us. Uh, some of them have COVID. Uh, we certainly want to be praying for people that, uh, that help people with COVID, like our first responders, EMTs, uh, nurses, doctors, healthcare professionals of all kinds who have continued to work throughout this pandemic. We want to be praying for them as well. Uh, and then we want to be praying for world events as well, such as the uh, explosion in Beirut, Lebanon yesterday. Uh, let's pray that uh, God will give comfort and peace to those who are hurting and, and healing as well, and, and uh, uh, that he will comfort those who have, who have lost loved ones or friends in that, in that tremendous blast. And pray that God would send revival to our to our land, uh, and to our world. Well, let's take our Bible uh, now and read here in John chapter number 8, and then we'll have a prayer time as we begin. Actually, I want to begin with the last verse in chapter number 7 as, uh, as, we, uh, as we read here tonight. In chapter 7, verse 53, the Bible says that everyone went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us 
that such should be stoned. What do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up, he saw no one but the woman. He said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray that you would bless the reading of your word, open our minds and hearts to the truth of God. Speak to us tonight through the power of the, of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, may it be a time of encouragement to us. In Jesus' name, amen. When you come to this passage of Scripture in your Bible, uh, perhaps there's a notation in your Bible, or maybe uh, beginning with verse 53 in chapter 7 down through uh, chapter 8, verse 11, those verses are in brackets, are set off some way, and maybe there's a notation in your Bible that says uh, these verses were not in the earliest manuscripts. Well, if it does say that, don't let that bother you. Um, this uh, incident is certainly an incident that's consistent with the life of Jesus, and, uh, and it is in a great number of older manuscripts as well. So don't let that bother you. Well, uh, it's interesting that... Uh, where the verse uh, markings are in chapter 8, it looks like chapter 7, verse 53, goes with what's written in chapter 8, verse 1. And you know that the verse markings were added by men. The, the, the scripture didn't come with verse markings the way that they are now. We, we added those later, just so as, uh, as a way to, to uh, keep up with where we are in the Bible. And so actually, chapter 7, verse 53, probably goes with what happens in chapter 8. That's why I began reading there. But notice that the Bible says there that everyone went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And I think John included that because he wanted to point out that uh, some people went to their homes, but they went to their homes without Jesus. And Jesus himself went to the Mount of Olives. I think that's the way of John reminding us that Jesus was uh, in some way uh, always an uninvited Savior. People often heard Jesus and then went about their lives as though he had said nothing. He was not wanted in their homes, and for many of them, he was not wanted in their hearts. And, uh, and so the Bible says Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Then the Bible tells us in verse number 2 that uh, early <clears throat> in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. And so Jesus had a practice of going to the temple when he was in Jerusalem and teaching his disciples and others who would listen there in and around the temple complex. As a matter of fact, there would have been a number of rabbis who met uh, in the courts of the temple with their disciples and, and had times of teaching. So it would not have been an unusual sight. Uh, but it would have been unusual that Jesus was the, do, the one doing the teaching because no one ever taught like the Lord Jesus. Uh, the Bible tells us that Jesus was a teacher of the Scripture. Twenty-one times in the Bible, it says that Jesus taught the people. Uh, the Bible says that in Mark chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus went all about Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And again, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, the Bible says Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. When Jesus sent his apostles out, they followed the same pattern of the Lord. They also taught the scripture. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5, verse 42, that daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. 
Uh, Paul and Barnabas continued the same uh, pattern of teaching. The Bible says in Acts 15 that Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So Jesus was the best teacher of the word of God that ever lived. And, uh, and people have been teaching the word of God since the days of the Lord Jesus here on the earth. The apostles, many of the disciples of the Lord, men who've been called to preach the word of God since that time have taught the Bible. And to be honest, teaching the word of God is the desire of my heart. It's the thing I feel God has most called me to, and it's always been the great joy of my life. There's nothing that I enjoy better than studying and preparing to preach and then preaching God's word. And so Jesus was a preacher of the word. He taught the word of God to the people. But then as we read through this passage also, we see that Jesus uh, was encountered, encountered a, a group of, of men, scribes and Pharisees, who brought to him a woman. And while they condemned her, Jesus refused to condemn her. The Bible says in verse 3 that the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman. And when they set, had set her in the midst, they said, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. This is the only place in the Bible, <clears throat> in the book of John rather, where uh, the word scribes appear. And so the scribes, along with the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees were not exactly the same things, but they, and, and they did not always agree with one another, but when it came to trying to entrap Jesus, uh, they agreed to work together, and so they did. They were trying to trip Jesus up, to cause him to say something that would cause him to get in trouble with the Roman government or with some aspect of, of, the, of the law of Moses. And so they brought a woman and sat before Jesus, and they said, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. I've always found it interesting that there had to have been a man also, and he also would have been caught in the act of adultery, but there's no mention of him anywhere in this passage. Well, these uh, scribes and Pharisees reminded Jesus of the law's demands. The law demanded that that woman be stoned, and, and they were right about that. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And so they, uh, they brought this woman to Jesus and they said, the law demands she be put to death. And again, the law demanded that the man be put to death as well, but they didn't bring the man. And so then they said, uh, what do you have to say about this? They tried to entrap Jesus. Verse 6 says that this they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. The way that the scribes and the Pharisees handled this event really uh, puts into question, brings into question their motives and, and their actions because it was obvious that they really didn't care about the well-being of the woman. Um, and, and they didn't uh, care about the well-being of the man that she would have been involved in. What they cared most about was not the people. What they cared most about was uh, some way of getting Jesus in trouble. They were trying to trap Jesus. Which is interesting because by the days of, of the Lord Jesus, the Jews did not always enforce the Old Testament law to the very letter. In other words, there might have been times when they would have known that something like this had happened, but they would not have demanded that the punishment be executed the way that uh, they did at this point. And that's only because they were trying to entrap the Lord Jesus. And they knew that if Jesus recommended stoning this woman, then he might run afoul of the Roman law because the Roman law didn't allow for any such punishment for that crime. And if Jesus counseled them not to stone the woman, then they knew that Jesus would be in danger of running uh, afoul of the, of the law of God. And, and they really wanted to catch Jesus in something that would, uh, would get him in trouble. It was sort of a catch-22 
situation. Well, Jesus outsmarted them. Instead of answering their question right away, Jesus knelt down to the ground, stooped to the ground, and began to write in the dirt with his, with his finger. Do you know this is the only place in the New Testament where there's any mention of Jesus writing anything at all? And we don't know what Jesus wrote in the dirt. It's always been a, a matter of interest among preachers and among Christians. What might Jesus have written in the dirt there, if he wrote anything? Well, we don't know what Jesus wrote, and the Bible doesn't tell us what Jesus wrote. And so, to be honest, it really is it's pointless for us to speculate. But that hasn't stopped us from speculating. People have, have tried to guess what Jesus might have been writing uh, since the days of the Lord himself. Some people have said that uh, maybe Jesus was writing the names of those men in that group, some of whom were guilty of the sin that they accused the woman of. And then other people have said that maybe Jesus was writing the name of their sins though their sins might have been different, in the dirt. Or maybe Jesus was writing something else. Someone also said that Jesus was writing what he, what he said to them in verse 7. Maybe that's what Jesus was writing in the dirt. But the reality is we just don't know, and, and for the, all intents and purposes, it really doesn't matter. It's not that important to the message of the, of the Scripture here. But we just know that Jesus did that. What is important is what Jesus said to them in verse 7. The Bible says in verse 7 that when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Now notice what Jesus did not say. Jesus did not say, as though all of them had a stone in their hand, let one of you throw the first stone, as if it was a given that the woman deserved to be stoned to death, and they were all standing ready to carry out that punishment. No, what Jesus said was, let the one of you who is without sin be the first one to throw a stone. Well, Jesus challenged them. And... Um, they had not expected the Lord Jesus to bring up their sins. You see, it's always easy for us, is it not, to see the sins and mistakes of other people. But when it's brought to our attention that our sins and mistakes are in much the same way, then it's harder for us to accept and even harder for us to see. And so Jesus confronted them with their own sinfulness. As a matter of fact, I, I read more than once in the last week or so that a scholar said that it's almost without question that some of these men would have been guilty of the same sin that the woman was guilty of because had Jesus just confronted them with a sin in general, they wouldn't have been surprised by that because the Bible says we're all sinners. But some of them must have been guilty of either the same sin or something similar as to what they accused this poor woman of. Well, what does that say? It says to me that, first of all, they were convicted by their own sins, whatever they were. My sin may be one thing, your sin may be another, but the reality is we've all sinned. That's what the Bible says more than one time. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there is, no, there is none righteous, no, not one. And so, in reality... We're all guilty of sin. My sin may be one thing, yours may be another, but we're all guilty. And then the Bible says that uh, in response to that, <clears throat> those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Well, if they were holding any stones in their hands when Jesus... Uh, called on the one who was without a sin to throw a stone first, they probably dropped them in the, in the dust there. And one by one, they turned and walked away, beginning with those who were the eldest and then followed by those who were younger. Why the eldest first? 
Well, probably because the eldest would have been wiser, certainly should have been wiser. The eldest would have been uh, fully aware of what Jesus was saying, would have understood the responsibility that was theirs, especially if they had this woman stoned to death and she was in fact not guilty or for some reason did not deserve to be stoned to death and they participated in that, uh, then they would have borne uh, a greater sense of guilt because the law did say that the person that was stoned for something like this was to be stoned by the witnesses. You couldn't accuse someone of something like this and walk off just to expect someone else to carry out the punishment. And so the elders left first because they would, might have been more fully aware of all that this meant. And they were convicted. And, uh, and so they walked away first. And so then Jesus <clears throat> called upon this woman to leave whatever sinful life she was involved in. Notice that Jesus never condoned her sin. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> it's only by implication that we could say right here that Jesus forgave her sin because the Bible doesn't say that she repented. But Jesus did challenge her about her lifestyle the way that he challenges all of us about our lifestyle, especially when we read the Word of God. The Holy Spirit begins to work in our life and remind us that we're not, uh, other people are not the only ones that have troubles in life. We ourselves aren't perfect either. And so Jesus asked the woman, Woman, where are those who have accused you? Is there no one to condemn you? And she said, There is no one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Some have said through the years that Jesus was condoning her actions because he didn't condemn her. But he didn't in any way condone her actions. He confronted her with it, told her to stop sinning, go and, and live a different lifestyle. He challenged her the way that he challenges each of us. Go and sin no more. Well, I hope that each of us will take that that phrase, that, that command of the Lord to go and sin no more into our own hearts and do what we can do to live a, a life of righteousness in this world. People are watching us the same way that people were watching that woman and the same way that people were watching those scribes and Pharisees as well. And even if there weren't any people watching, we know that God is always watching, isn't he? Thanks for joining us tonight. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you're always watching. Thank you, Lord, that you challenge our ideas, our mistakes, our own hypocrisy. You call on us all, Lord, to go and sin no more. Help us this week to live a life of righteousness in this world that Jesus could be exalted and glorified through it. And help us to do something that will make a difference in somebody's life for Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.